Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up, Melbourne's set to endure another week of lockdown, but tolerance of life in COVID limbo is wearing thin. We've got to run this to ground, because if we don't, people will die. The Gap Within the Gap, a new report exposes the shocking disadvantage experienced by stolen generation survivors and their descendants. And lest we forget, the National Archives looks to public donations to fund its memory keeping before vital records disintegrate and disappear. Joining me on the panel tonight, Professor in Modern History at Macquarie University, author of books about Azaria Chamberlain, amongst other things, Michelle Arrow joins us. Great to have you back. Hello, thank you. In Melbourne, CEO of SNAKE, National Voice for Our Children, the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, Catherine Little. Good to see you, Catherine. Nice to see you too. Political reporter at The Guardian Australia at the end of another very busy day, Amy Ramikas. G'day. Hello. And also in Canberra, former Liberal ACT Chief Minister and Small Business Ombudsman Kate Carnell. Welcome back, Kate. Hi, Julia. Hello. Thanks. If you want to join on Twitter, you just do what you always do. Use the hashtag The Drum. And we are also on Facebook now. Now, the news may have been expected, but it doesn't make it any easier for millions across Victoria. Melbourne's lockdown will continue for another seven days as authorities get to grips with a ballooning number of exposure sites and close contacts. The actual number of new cases today is only six, but according to Chief Health Officer Brett Sutton, the highly infectious nature of the current strain has changed their calculations. We're seeing um, a greater proportion of our total number of cases arising from transmissions in those casual or um, more fleeting uh, exchanges. We do have a suspicion that there's been transmission two hours after an infectious case has left uh, an indoor enclosed space. They were there for a, uh, a substantial period of time, but they had left uh, two hours before uh, the next exposed individual came in who's become a case. Now that's that's in the, the kind of measles category of infectiousness. Regional Victoria is most likely opening up in the next 24 hours if the number of infections remains low, but some restrictions will remain in place. And with continued restrictions and an extended lockdown in Melbourne, many businesses will be hit hard. With that in mind, the state government will be expanding their business support packages, but have made it clear that it's time for the federal government to cough up as well. As we did last week, we have also renewed our request to the Commonwealth to activate a JobKeeper-style support for Victorians who have been impacted by these restrictions. The ball is in the federal government's court. Victorian businesses, Victorian workers are demanding that they respond. Uh, that is what the Treasurer is advocating for. It's what I'm advocating for with the Prime Minister. Uh, and I'm very hopeful of a, of a positive outcome. However, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg has made it clear that further federal money is far from guaranteed. What we need to think about, obviously, given the pandemic is still with us, is how we approach this on a national basis. It's not about Victoria, West Australia, individual cases. It's about on a national basis. And we will stick to our principles, namely our approaches will continue to be national, sustainable, where support is offered, it's through existing systems. Those principles have served us well, uh, Greg, uh, from the start of this crisis and they'll continue to serve us well. Catherine, are Victorians prepared mentally for another seven days of lockdown? Uh, <laughs> that's a hard one, isn't it? Uh, I, I was actually uh, having a listen to the radio just yesterday morning and uh, it, would, it would indicate that a lot of people are really, really struggling, particularly as the reality of um, homeschooling and those sorts of things starts to kick in. Um, you know, I think in some ways we learnt a lot of lessons in the last um, series of lockdowns, you know, things like bubbles potentially help, you know, for people like me that live by themselves. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you're surrounded by uh, a different living environment. You know, I, I know that, we, you know, just 
quite literally across the road from where I live is is, is a cafe that's been closed because it was an ex exposure site. And uh, immediately you start thinking about the people that have jobs there. You know, the gym that I'd normally go to every afternoon, it's it's closed. You're thinking about those sorts of people when you, again, if you're a people manager like myself, you're worried about how your team members are struggling. Um, have they got, you know, have they got an outdoor backyard that they can walk in? Are they managing to get outside? So I think there, I think there is a lot of positiveness, uh, positivity, sorry, but I think there's also a level of distress again because it works a bit like a trigger. And and, and certainly when I'm thinking about those triggers, you know, the sector that I work in, it, it's meant that a lot of frontline services have had to mobilise very, very quickly for a whole set of new vulnerabilities that will come out as, as a result of the fact that families are trapped inside their homes again. Mm. And yet, yet, Kate, knowing all of this is going on, the yeah. federal government refusing to, put, you know, put, extend you know, JobKeeper just to Victoria and saying we need to have this as a national system, we've always intended it to be a national system, is that fair? Look, we do need a national system, but what that national system needs to do is to say when there's a shutdown, wherever that might be, there is a number of um, benefits or payments that will occur rather than have a one-by-one -one approach here. You know, in Victoria at the moment, for the small businesses involved, that those people who are closed, the $2,500 that, that has been announced from the state government won't even cover their rent on their premises, let alone their staff, or the amount of money they've lost by having to throw out food and other perishables for the, uh, for the, for the restaurants, the cafes, and so on. So yes, that's nice, a nice amount of money, but it doesn't come anywhere near uh, covering the costs involved. And of course, for, um, for the staff, if they're casuals, they won't get any, uh, any shifts, so they won't have any money coming in. But for the permanent employees, the small business owners have to pay them mm. uh, and their rent and all the other things without JobKeeper or the rent reductions or the other uh, payments that were in place uh, for the last lockdown. So this is a very real problem mm. for small business owners. I think there'll be a number of them that'll just give up, just say it's all too hard. Mm. So the federal government should be coughing up at this point on a state by state basis? I think they should have a, uh, we should have a plan that national cabinets sign off on that say if there's a shutdown, then here's what will happen. We will give um, JobKeeper equivalent type payments to cover the, the numbers of staff, that will give payments to, to help with things like rent and the amounts of money that are lost when you've got to throw out, you know, flowers and food and perishables mm. generally, uh, which of course happen, you know, not just in restaurants and caterers, but also in events, mm. um, in the arts, a whole range of areas. Right. Um, Amy, we do know that Mr Molino is saying, I'm going to take this to National Cabinet, I'm going to have strong words with the Prime Minister, um, and yet, do you think that he will be able to convince them to budge on this? And could we get a, a situation where a federal government is saying, well, we don't agree with a further extension of this lockdown, so therefore the we're problem, not going to fund it? Yes. Yeah, the problem all comes down to politics. I mean, the reason that we don't have anything in place at the moment is because we know that the federal government doesn't want to encourage the states or the territories to go into lockdown. We know that they are still widely against having lockdowns, even if publicly they're saying we support whatever it is the states and the territories decide. They don't want lockdowns. They've never wanted lockdowns. They've always wanted, you know, freedom of movement and dealing with the virus within Australia's borders. So that's the main hurdle for Victoria and in this moment to overcome is the politics of the situation. Mm. But we do have several instances where we have had states who have had natural disasters and everything has shut down at a moment's notice and we step up with disaster payments and there are systems in place where everybody just registers and then they get that money in their account through the existing systems. We know how to do it. We know that the government has planned for further lockdowns because it's in 
in the budget. They're anticipating that we might have a lockdown, you know, once every three weeks somewhere or other. So we know that the government is aware of it. What we don't know is why they're refusing to budge as we're facing a two week lockdown in one of the biggest states in Australia. Mm. All right, for more on this, we're joined in Melbourne by infectious diseases physician at James Cook University, Emma McBride. Emma, welcome to the drum. Thanks for having me. Good to have you back again. Now, we've had snap lockdowns <clears throat> in Brisbane, in Adelaide, in Perth of about three days duration. <clears throat> Victoria's had a five day lockdown previously. What is, what is the difference with Victoria this time? Well, there's a few differences. Uh, one is there's certainly more chains of transmission than we saw with some of those very uh, hasty, I think, lockdowns that happened in Queensland and earlier this year in, in Melbourne. So there's definitely some established community transmission going on. The strain of the virus is particularly, uh, is known to be particularly transmissible. So the, um, I guess if you like, the margin for error is, is lower. Uh, so there is some justification for this lockdown. However, of course, we've got uh, on the other side of the coin is that uh, we, we really should be looking at uh, no longer requiring lockdowns if only we could get a sufficient number of people vaccinated. Mm. What do you say? We've been, <clears throat> we've been talking about you know, the, the politicking surrounding this issue. What are the consequences for, of this politicking on actually being able to handle it and keep COVID under control? Well... I, I think one thing we have to think about is that it's not just uh, Melbourne, people from Melbourne right now who are suffering and uh, th there's a lot of people who are, whose jobs are in international travel and trade and tourism who from the very start for over a year now have, uh, have had minimal income uh, and their support has also been reduced, which makes it hard to open up, I guess, um, because if uh, every time you open up and then need to close at an international level or a state level, uh, people, uh, people's livelihoods on the line again, then those businesses are just one by one going to disappear. So I think, I think that's really difficult. Um, it also makes it harder for people to, I guess, you know, just survive from one, from one um, lockdown to the next. Right. But I don't know that bringing back job keeper is as important as ensuring that people get vaccinated. I, I think that's by far the the most important thing to do to get out of this problem that we're right. in. And even now, why not let people who are fully vaccinated travel and and attend events and mm. shop and all of those things? That would be one way of, uh, of opening up at least to some extent. Right, so building in incentives for people to get vaccinated. It's partly to incentivise people to get vaccinated. It's partly just to, to stratify by risk and allow life to get on for mm. people who've been vaccinated. Do you think this, the, this lockdown extension was the right judgment call in this instance? I, I'm sort of on the spectrum of thinking lockdown should only ever occur if they absolutely have to. Uh, and so I'm a bit disappointed that the lockdown has continued. Uh, I, I, I can see the rationale. Uh, I'd like to have seen some of the more stringent um, measures lifted, uh, particularly schools. I can't see a great rationale for continuing to keep children away from their schooling. Um, so, you know, I, I can understand that, that various regions and hotspots should be uh, self-quarantining and, uh, but I don't, I'm not a big fan of of additional lockdowns. Right? But, but what of Brett, Brett Sutton's remarks about this being an absolute beast and a variant that needed to be brought under control because it is so highly transmissible? I mean, is that is that true or, or not? This strain is very closely related to another strain. They're both uh, called the Delta variant now. Uh, that is highly transmissible. So it is likely that this is a, a much more transmissible strain than, than previous strains, yes. So we have to treat it with, with special caution, and that special caution means getting vaccinated. That is the only way this is going to stop. And until, and, and, and until we do is a question. I mean, what should we be doing, um, Michelle, with, with hotel quarantine? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? We've had reviews into hotel quarantine. We, we've 
you know, we've examined the flaws in the system and one of the things about this new lockdown, it feels a bit like deja vu. We kind of knew some of the problems that we were dealing with, you know, that were investigated last year. There's a great deal of anxiety, I think, because of the greater um, transmissibility of this variant. But it's frustrating because, you know, we knew that these flaws in the system were there and yet they still haven't been addressed. So it's it's a real, I mean, I think if we could take the advice of the, you know, inquiries into hotel quarantine seriously and kind of build in some of those new structures and systems to deal with it, that would be a much better solution. But obviously vaccination is the big issue mm. here. And, you know, we all know that the vaccination program has been you know, endless delays, but also missed targets. And, and, you know, we do need to make sure that people are vaccinated and make it easier for people to be vaccinated. Mm, but, the, but the, at least some, there's more urgency has been brought to it now, so people exactly. are likely to overcome the hesitancy. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is really interesting is that since the weekend announcement around Victoria, that, you know, lots of people I know have gone out and been vaccinated where they were kind of hedging their bets before. So I think in that sense, it has raised the stakes and that's really important and kind of made people investigate vaccination is a much more, um, you know, direct and, and important thing that they need to do now rather than putting it off, rather than having their flu shot, rather than waiting, you know. Right. So that's important too. And incentives could work there as well. Um, Emma, what would, what would you do with this hotel quarantine system, which has proven to be porous in exactly the wrong ways? Absolutely. So um, without wanting to sound like a broken record, <laughs> imagine if... The people in hotel quarantine, the person who came in with the virus and the person who was quarantined who had no virus but caught it in quarantine, imagine if either of those people had been vaccinated before they arrived, uh, we wouldn't be having this problem. So my, the first thing I would do is ensure that any person coming to Australia is fully vaccinated. Uh, that would really reduce the risk of, of transmissions happening during quarantine. There are other things you can do too. Make sure that people wear masks when they open their door and get their food. Make sure there's time in between door opening build whole brand new systems, but that'll be excellent for the next pandemic that we get in a few years' time. It's not going to help for this one. Mm. Well, that's a, that, that is also dependent, Kate Carnell, that's dependent on a couple of things, uh, asking all people who come to the country to be vaccinated. It depends on availability and, and whether or not we make it mandatory, uh, uh, you know, a necessary requirement. What do you make of that suggestion? Well, I think we've just got to make sure everyone's vaccinated. We can't have people coming into the country that aren't vaccinated if we can possibly avoid it. And certainly if people are going to come into the country and, and uh, not be quarantined, and we've just seen a scenario where people, where the person who spread the virus in, um, in Melbourne had been in a 14-day lockdown and still ended up um, in, a, in a situation where they possibly caught the virus in quarantine and then spread it. So it's absolutely true that vaccination is the, is the answer here. And I think in the foreseeable future, we've got to make it as compulsory as is possible. <laughs> and I know that that's really hard thing to do. It is. But, it's, either uh, comp it's either compulsory or it's not. I mean, I, I want to bring you in um, on this, Amy, because where does that leave those people, Australians wanting to come home, who might not, for whatever reason, have, have been vaccinated? Well, yeah, and, and that's assuming that they have access to the vaccines that Australia does and the vaccines that we are accepting and not every country is using the same vaccine. You can't make it mandatory that everybody who enters Australia gets vaccinated. I doubt you could make it mandatory that everybody in Australia can get vaccinated. You can only offer incentives or you can do the, you know, carrot and stick approach. The issue is... We don't have a quarantine system that is up to the task of handling the virus anymore. It was set up so quickly. It was set up in hotels which are not designed as quarantine facilities. That's why we're having issues with ventilation because you share ventilation in hotel. The only way that you're going to get on top of this is yes, get the vaccine rollout ab absolutely happening and get that under control so you can get as much of the population 
uh, vaccinated as possible and secondly prepare for a future where we're going to be living with this virus for quite some time just like we do with the flu and we need a way to protect people from that and that is we know dedicated quarantine facilities and there is no reason to be dragging feet on this there is none at all other than stubbornness and I think that the government doesn't want the federal government doesn't want to take responsibility for quarantine because if it does and there is an outbreak then that comes on them as well and so far they've been shielded from that because it's been at the responsibility of the states. Mm. Although that was also decided at, at national national cabinet that will be within yeah. the jurisdiction of the states and territories but Emma before we let you go I just want to get your advice on this. South Australian authorities have defended a decision to allow the Collingwood AFL team to travel to Adelaide for a match this weekend despite the border currently being closed to Victoria. Now officials say they are going to great lengths to keep things safe the team's going to be in and out on the same day and they're going to create a sterile corridor between the airport and the Oval and players must return a negative test before being allowed to play. The state's chief health officer also had this advice to offer. It's actually my job not to make a sort of moral judgment about whether football's more important than something else. My job is actually to keep this and make this as safe as possible. If you are at um, Adelaide Oval and the ball comes towards you, my um, advice to you is to duck and just do not touch that ball. It's a tough call, Emma. If the ball's coming towards you, yep, right? Time to duck. OK, I'm going to start with uh, rebutting the previous speaker, if that's all right. Um, with quarantine, it's of course, it's a simple thing to say to people, don't come into Australia unless you're vaccinated. It's easier to get a vaccine in any other country other than Australia. We're in like the bottom 10th of the world in terms of access to vaccination at the moment. It's simple. About 3 billion doses have been given out in the world. It would be an absolutely straightforward thing to say, don't come to Australia unless you're fully vaccinated. Uh, then quarantine may not even be necessary. It's obviously not working, uh, so it's time to dismantle it. The second thing, the Collingwood. Um, I think we have seen a lot of uh, value judgments being made. I think it's very clear who are important and elite in Australian society at the moment, and that's uh, pop stars, actors and footy players. Uh, so we're being treated in different classes um, and different categories depending on uh, you know, our star status at the moment and, and, and health is being used uh, to, to, uh, to do this. So I, I think uh, it's time everyone got a little bit more honest and transparent in the way they went about uh, deciding who was risk, risky and who's risk free. Right, and, and, the, and while we're doing that, we should duck and, and avoid the ball should it come Better our duck way. and avoid the ball, because <laughs> yes, okay. that's, that's the way to avoid COVID. <laughs> okay. All right. Emma McBride, great to have you on the show. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> Emma McBride is an infectious diseases physician at James Cook University. Well, if you needed a sign that a handle on the health crisis is essential to economic success, you only need to look to the latest GDP figures. Australia's economy has recovered back to pre-COVID levels. The latest ABS data show the economy has grown 1.8% over the March quarter and has expanded by 1.1% from the same time last year. Surging iron ore prices and exports, as well as increased consumer spending, are behind much of the growth. But does this translate to financial security for ordinary Australians? The ABC's Australia Talk survey of 60,000 people found one in four Australians are concerned they'll lose their jobs in the next 12 months. And 63% believe there needs to be an increase to the minimum wage. It isn't all doom and gloom, however. 72% of correspondents reported being happy with their job. A happy three in four. Now, Amy, I want to talk to you about, the, about the, these results generally. Today, the Treasurer said no other major economy is bigger than it was pre-pandemic, other than Australia. He called it an amazing feat. I mean, he's, he's right, isn't he? We've done very well in the last 12 months. Australia's economy has done exceptionally well in the last 12 months uh, and a lot of it is down to the health response which saw life return to relatively normal within Australian borders for most states, most jurisdictions uh, fairly quickly. I mean the Prime Minister is right when he says Australians are living in a way that is not, uh, not seen around the world but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is feeling financially stable. You can look at an economy and see that it's growing but you can also 
see that the richer are getting richer and people who were struggling before the pandemic are struggling even more now. I mean, whenever I talk to, to my friends or family, no one feels particularly financially secure. Everyone's just still kind of holding on to minimum savings if they've got them because they're not sure whether or not there is going to be another lockdown, what's going to happen to their jobs. So we have seen an increase in spending. We've gotten very lucky with the iron ore prices, but that is not going to last forever. Mm. Kate Carnell, how do you read those? I mean, the figures, of course, don't tell the full story. It's been a broad-based recovery. Um, the economists are pleased, and yet, and yet, there's a lot of gaps, as Amy is, is saying. Look, there are a lot of gaps, but it's an amazing recovery, let's be fair, and you can't look at it any other way. I think one of the things that's important to remember is Australia um, has the highest minimum wage in the world, and that happened in, I think, 2019. The minimum wage goes up every year. It's set by the Fair Work Commission and over the last number of years it's gone up at a faster rate than inflation. But then inflation has been really low. Last year Australia ended up with um, personal savings at the highest level they'd ever been because people were putting money aside, not being too sure where the economy's going. And one of the reasons that the economy is doing so well at the moment is people have started to spend again. So we're seeing retail sales go up a whole heap, uh, more than we actually expected. But all of that's lovely and amazing and unemployment's come down and so on. But there's whole areas of the economy that um, simply haven't benefited. You just don't want to be a travel agent, is the story. You don't want to be involved in, uh, in overseas students, you know, bringing in overseas students. Um, anything to do with um, overseas, uh, the overseas travel industry is in all sorts of trouble. If you're in the business of, uh, of running concerts in the arts and so on, you're in a world of, a world of pain. So it's important to remember that although a, a chunk of the economy, a good part of the economy is doing well, there is a, a lot of people who are still really, really struggling. Mm. And some of those are at universities. Um, Michelle, you were, you were nodding yes. firmly when we're talking about reliance on, on, on students from, yeah. you know, for international students. Well, where does this leave universities? Yeah, look, I mean, universities are really struggling. I mean, one of the things that we've lost about 17,000 jobs across the sector since last year. Um, international students are not coming back in the numbers that they were there beforehand. It looks like they probably won't be coming back until at least, you know, when the border reopens next year. The sector got a almost 10% cut in the budget, you know, a reduction in funding on top of the reduction of funding that international students provide. So the sector is doing it incredibly tough. You know, we're going through rounds of forced redundancies at my own institution at the moment. Many universities have made a lot of staff redundant, but of course, the uh, Job Ready Graduates package has meant that there's more students there to teach, fewer staff to teach them. So one of the things that is very frustrating about this economic recovery is that universities could have been an engine room of that recovery. They could have been a place where innovation, where new teaching, new qualifications, you know, people go to back to universities in, in economic tough times to retrain. And of course, the se sector is just really, really struggling. And I think that we're not likely to see an improvement in that, you know, for years to come. I so think. how's the mood amongst academics and university staff? Oh, incredibly bleak. I mean, mm. I think one of the things that, you know, people are very anxious about keeping their jobs, um, anxious that they might lose their jobs. Um, you and know, that makes a very toxic, uncertain oh, environment to work in, doesn't it? You're it's awful. Your shoulder. Yeah. yeah. And that's on top of all the casual staff who, you know, universities have already been way too reliant on casual staff as a sector overall. And of course, so many of those staff disappeared and they didn't, their numbers didn't even get counted properly, you know, in, in terms of how many staff we've lost. And the sort of tragic thing is I see so many talented young researchers who are looking for careers in academia. That's what they've trained for, for 10 years or more. And the future, the jobs just aren't there, you know. So it is incredibly um, depressing when we sort of see the, this economic recovery, but I just don't think that a lot of people are necessarily experiencing that feeling of, oh, great, the GDP is looking so great. You know, I just don't think that that registers. You know, if you were right. trying to buy a house at the moment and trying to enter the housing market, yep. I mean, houses in Sydney have gone up by $8,500 a week. It's like the price of, you know, it's 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 almost unfathomable, isn't it? You know, yep. and, and that GDP figure is partly built on the back of that increase in housing, you know, in housing prices, but that's not a good thing for a lot of people. So I yeah. think it's a really uneven, as Amy said, it's a very uneven recovery. Yeah, Kate, did you want to jump in? 
Oh, look, um, one of the things we're seeing now in the business sector is lots of businesses not being able to get the staff they need to fill current jobs. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing particularly in, in hospitality, but more broadly, mm -hmm. businesses as well, having, yep. yeah, people have not being able to open open their businesses, having to pull back on shifts, yeah. not being able to, not, not being able to actually provide the, the services that people want. So mm -hmm. we've got a whole lot of issues. And you know, those international students mm -hmm. provided a lot of uh, a, a lot of jobs or a lot of work in the job market in Australia. So mm. them not being here, the backpackers not being here, um, international people coming in on, on um, work-related visas not being here is really impacting on the job market significantly. Right. I guess, Catherine, then that this explains a lot of the, you know, the, the, the results from the Australia Talks mm -hmm. um, survey. One in four Australians worry they'll lose their jobs in the next 12 months. That's a significant mm. number. It is a significant number and, and I certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm a manager, right, so I don't find that surprising because for as long as I've been a manager, words like um, change is constant have, you know, that phrase has been a constant because the the environment is constantly flexing, our technologies are constantly flexing, the jobs that we need and the jobs that are going to be there are constantly changing. So, you know, um, I, certainly I spend a lot of my time future forecasting and saying, okay, well, how do I position this particular business to, to get what it needs? How, what is our operational model? What is our finance model? And certainly I know I spent some time um, in Adelaide recently, you know, in the city, and I went to uni in Adelaide and I was looking at all the university buildings that weren't there when I was at uni and thinking of that as a financial model and wondering, you know, because you know, I look at the own vulnerabilities of, of the business that I work in. And I thought to myself, you know, in some ways, while, while, while the job I have is really, really tough because we're project-based, which, which places extreme pressure on your operations, mm -hmm. um, at least I'm not reliant on one significant funding stream. So uh, look, I get it, I get it, and I know that people feel um, uncomfortable at this point in time. I also get that figures never ever tell the true story and certainly where it uh, I'm certainly really conscious that you know some people are doing really well uh, and a lot of the people in particular in the sectors that I support are not doing too well uh, and those jobs aren't there and certainly um, you know it, it hides it hides discrepancies um, and we're really good at telling a story that perhaps isn't fair. Mm. All right, look, if you want to see how your views compare to other Australians, just head to australiatalks.abc.net.au forward slash survey. It's actually a really fun thing to do. And if you don't forget as well to tune in for a special TV event hosted by Annabelle Crabb and Nazim Hussain, unpacking all of this and much more, and that's on Monday, June 21. Now you're watching The Drum with me on the panel, Professor in Modern History at Macquarie University, Michelle Arrow. In Melbourne, CEO of Snake, National Voice for Our Children, Catherine Little. In Canberra, political reporter at The Guardian Australia, Amy Ramikas. And also in Canberra, former Liberal ACT Chief Minister and Small Business Ombudsman, Kate Carnell. The Australian National Archives, based in Canberra, describes itself as the memory of the nation. Established in 1983, its collection of more than 40 million items, running at 384 kilometres, are intended to enable historians to tell stories about our past, to fact-check various claims and to document the moments that have shaped a nation. But now many of these records are disintegrating and need to be digitised before they're permanently lost. The Drums Ruby Cornish has more. Australia's National Archives is the biggest set of historical records our country has. From involvement in the world wars, to early expeditions to the Antarctic, to the construction of our most iconic buildings. It contains more than 40 million items of our collective memory. but it's a memory that is fast disappearing. A review published last year, conducted by former Finance Secretary David Chun, found that a reduction in funding and staff means the archive is struggling to meet its mandate to secure and preserve archival resources. Paper files, audiovisual content on magnetic tape, film and photographs are disintegrating. 
some are falling victim to vinegar syndrome, being irreversibly degraded by chemical reactions. Others are growing mould, fading and being eaten away by nitric acid. The Tune Review found that even if the archives used all of its $6 million capital budget for digitising, it would take nearly 70 years for the archives to digitise only the highest priority records in the collection. It recommended a seven-year, $67.7 million program to get those records digitised faster. But the May budget did not deliver for the archives. Why and, did every other cultural institution yes. in the Commonwealth receive support, but not the archives? The government says it's still deciding how it will implement the Tune Review's recommendations. It asks <laughs> us to turn our minds to what represents an enormous transformation of the way we do archives in this country. That necessitates a different approach to simply putting a few more dollars in the tin, which is what has occurred for other agencies. As of March, the wait list to access documents was more than 22,000 applications long. In the absence of a funding injection, the archives has resorted to other means, including asking the public for donations on its website and creating a membership program. As a result of that, we've received something over $30,000 in donations and I think we've up to about 500 or so memberships that have signed up. Michelle, you're a historian. What, what are we in danger of losing? Look, we're in danger of losing so much. You know, the, the archives has kind of, in some ways, because the National Archives is so vast, we don't yet know exactly you know, the entire scope of all of the material that's in the collection. But some of the things that they have nominated that they are um, very concerned about that they will lose are things like um, audio recordings of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which was only in the, you know, early 1990s. But yeah, because wow. we're all in a kind of magnetic tape era, the great sort of VHS era of the mid to late 20th century, yeah. we're going to lose so much of a record of everyday oh. life that's within living memory, but yet it will be gone because it was not being preserved. It will go off what archivists call the digital cliff, which is what when technological, you know, redundancy and kind of material disintegration mm. will just destroy mm. this archive. Which is it's what would happen if you're in your garage and you pull down your VHS, no, it won't work anymore. Exactly. The right machine to exactly. Play it in. What other kinds of documents? So there's a there's a register on um, Pitcairn Island, isn't there, of the Yes. There's the some older the material that yep. they've kind of been given that to, to preserve and, mm -hmm. and been responsible there. There's a lot of audiovisual material, so um, records of speeches. The ABC's audiovisual records are all kept there, and so programs that might not yet be in high archival demand, you know, they might not have been requested to be digitised already, um, are all sitting there in the, um, in the archives. Lots and lots of photographs. So the government, Commonwealth Government used to have a photographic agency that would go out and take photographs of, you know, all kinds of things. So it's an, as a record of ordinary Australians in their interactions with government mm. across the 20th century. It's not an archive of, you know, if you think about the National Library, it collects papers of great writers in, and intellects. Important people. Important which people. Are usually white and blokes. Exactly. Kind of Prime yep. ministers, all yep. those kinds of people. They will absolutely have their own archival records preserved. What we lose in this collection is the voices of ordinary Australians because mm. they're the, every time people interact with government, they go to fight a war for the government, they migrate to Australia, they leave a paper record or they leave an audiovisual record and that will go if mm. we don't act to preserve this material and to fund the archives adequately, frankly. I mean, it, you, know. you spent a long time in there, didn't you um, do your yeah. research on the, was it the Royal Commission into Human Relationships yes, in the I 70s? Yes, I did. And one of the interesting things that, and, and again something that could give you a sense of just the sort of weird, unique records that are kept there. One of the things the Royal Commission on Human Relationships did was conduct what they called a phone-in about unwanted pregnancy because that was one of the sort of areas they were focusing on, on abortion and, and abortion access in the 1970s. And I remember one day sitting there listening to recordings of phone calls from people talking about having abortions or men ringing up saying, my wife had an abortion and I didn't want her to. Like wow. this extraordinary, intimate, mm. you know, material that is not captured anywhere else, mm. you know. It is a priceless record and to be honest, we don't even quite know what's riches are there you know so in some ways we are preserving this material not just for researchers today but for researchers in 50 years time or citizens in 50 years time who might want to see 
their relatives' military service records or records of institutional, you know, engagement, citizenship papers, all of that material, it's all there. So I just think as a Commonwealth Government agency, it needs to be funded adequately to do its work. And you can see from your package there that, you know, they have run into very long delays for researchers who are trying to access material and this looming digital cliff which is a very urgent you know it's a really urgent problem 2025 is not far away mm. um, um Catherine when we when we look at this and I think the archives are asking for what 67 million mm. to do this and the government has shown a willingness to invest in 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 history we have was it 500 million for the war memorial 100 million for um, a war memorial in in France um, and, and 250, I think, for a cook, some kind of memorial. Um, does it not ask you like, what is it that we prioritise when it comes to record keeping? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Where do you start on this one? Yeah. Look, at the, in terms of uh, saving stories and uh, saving archives, this is something that First Nations people have been banging their heads against a wall on for decades. You know, um, part of the reason we have our First Nations media sector actually relates, A, to the Royal Commission into Black Deaths and Custody, where it was found that it was absolutely necessary for Aboriginal people to have mechanisms and platforms on which our own views could be distributed and which we could see ourselves, right? So critical, critical points in time um, are recorded in documents like that and proceedings like that. But the other thing we know is at that point in time, our mob were also identifying that we were going to run into a significant problem in that our culture is based on history. It is based on stories. Our old people, they're like encyclopedias. They understand how things happen before they happen um, in, in a way that, you know, people would go to uni and study for years and years and years to understand. Um, so when media started emerging in Australia, the old people went out and said, OK, let's get our hands on any tool we can and let's get those voices, let's get those stories, let's record these ceremonies. We don't know how we're going to manage those going forward, but we know this is absolutely vitally critical. Uh, and then there was no way to save these or, or to preserve these in an, in an adequate format or, in, in, you know, there, those massive archives, you know, while we do have IATSIS um, and certainly we do have the National Center on the film and archive um, available to us, there are still significant collections of irreplaceable documentation sitting out in communities all over the place and, and with the same problems associated with them. And that is that the tapes are degrading and that is that the platforms are disappearing. And, and we've been screaming for ages saying, when we lose this, we lose something that can never, ever, ever be repaired. And yet we had it for 60,000 years. And, and again, these things are vitally important, particularly when we're talking about things um, like you've identified later in the program, your stolen generations, those mob that need to reconnect to who they were, mm -hmm. to hear the stories of their mothers, to hear the stories of their grandmothers. So does it concern me that Australia doesn't invest enough money into, into this space? Absolutely. Um, does it bother me that, you know, it, it gets a national platform at this point in time when we've been screaming about it for years? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that sits very uncomfortably. Mm -hmm. um, uh Kate, I'm, I'm convinced by both Michelle and Catherine to put a, a, a lot of money into this, to preserve all of this. I've trained as a historian. I've spent years of my life in archives. I love archives. I love how you have to wear those funny little gloves and put leads on it so you don't crease the material. I love feeling actual letters that were written two or 300 years ago and working out that people have misinterpreted things, but um, actually I've read it a completely different way. I just love the whole thing. These funny little desks in these dusty places and people who really, really care about getting history right and telling it right. But not everyone has that same kind of passion, right? Not everyone spends their weekends no. and holidays in strange places um, looking up, you know, old documents. How, if, 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 with all your vast experience as a lobbyist um, and in politics, how would you get people to make this a priority? Look, I think just about everybody would say when listening to this program, yeah, yeah, we've got to, we've got to fund that because we do need to ensure that our history is preserved. The problem is, from a budget perspective, if you're a government putting together the, the budget last year and you've got COVID, you've got bushfires, you've got aged care, you've got disabilities, you've got, you know, you can keep going on with 
with the priorities that people are encouraging you to fund. And unfortunately, those uh, uh, the people, the very small number of people like you who are historians and um, possibly aren't getting their the message across. I think it's absolutely fine, by the way, to go out to the private sector to see who um, to get support for digitisation of the collection. We've done that at the National Gallery forever. Mm. We've been really, uh, you know, we we need private sector donations to museums, galleries, um, all sorts of things, and the and the archives should be part of that. But it is important to raise the profile of. Uh, digitising this, uh, this information and to try to get it up the agenda in terms of funding. But right at the moment, you've got to say, the federal government has one or two things on its, on its agenda that absolutely must be funded, mm. such as reforms in the aged care arena, such as vaccinating well, the whole population. Well, also the War Memorial, though, when we're looking at yeah. you know, $500 million, yeah. if we took maybe a little chunk of that little bit, it's, they have well, one less room. Well, I don't know. Well, re remember the War Memorial is digitising a, a chunk of the collection we're talking about. You can go to the War Memorial and get um, online the information about your relatives yes, and so Yes, but this so is a on, particular so. kind of history, isn't it? But, but Michelle, it quickly. Look, I, I think $500 million for the War Memorial, to, which includes demolishing a building that is less than 20 years old, Anzac Hall, to rebuild it, you know, bigger and better. I just kind of think it's a crazy set of priorities that you would knock down a building that's 20 years old while the National Archives material disintegrates. Like, it's, it's crazy. I think there'd be a lot of people who wouldn't agree with you on that, <laughs> who believe really strongly that the War Memorial... But the thing is, is it, is it, should it be an either or kind of situation? Yeah, no. I mean, Amy, this isn't a partisan issue, you know, that, but as in on both fronts, as in there's speeches by Curtin and by Menzies mm. and by Chifley all in the National Archives that need to be digitised and, and both sides of Parliament have been mm. respon responsible for cutting funding to this. So where does it come from that we can kind of, be, before the pandemic hit, this is not a pr priority? I think it, it, it's what Catherine was talking about, where we just tend to brush aside history that we don't want to think about. We have a real habit of whitewashing history in this country and teaching it in a certain way and just kind of putting everything that we don't want to think about into a little box. And now we know that that box is disintegrating and there are quite a lot of stories that we need to know, that they make up the soul of this country. But we need to care about history and we need to care about all of it before we start caring about saving this. But on the cost point of view, $67 million over seven years is just peanuts to a federal budget. It is not a lot of money. This has been a decision that they have taken. And yes, they are looking at the review and they're deciding what to do with that, but they're not looking at it fast enough. I mean, what price do you put on the soul of this country? Because it's not just what the archives mean, you know, for the historical memory of the country. It's all of the individual families who have made up Australia who have stories sitting in those boxes, who are in those tapes that are never going to learn exactly where they came from because we don't care enough now to save it. Mm. Mm. All right, I want to move on to another part of our um, history now, which is in Western Australia's Burrup Peninsula. It is a vast canvas for the world's biggest and oldest collections of rock engravings. More than a million petroglyphs are etched into the red rocked landscape, including the earliest known image of a human face. But there's growing concern that industrial emissions produced by nearby oil and gas plants could be degrading the rock art. And as the drum Stephanie Bolchi reports, the Western Australian Government is contemplating allowing more extraction in the region. These are just some of the more than one million engravings at Morajuga. They are the beginning of song lines and creation stories for further afield. While research is underway to date the collection, it's believed some could be more than 40,000 years old. We have um, art here of animals that, are, that have, uh, have long been extinct, like the Tasmanian tiger and the um, fat-tailed um, kangaroo that lived on the Barrett region tens of thousands of years ago. Last year, the area was placed on the tentative World Heritage List, with work continuing on the nomination. It's been a long one for our 
our, our circle of elders. It's been something that we've always aspired to. But others are concerned the nomination could be put into jeopardy. There is more industry going out onto the borough. I am deeply concerned that this might impede uh, UNESCO determining a World Heritage listing for the area. The engravings have sat alongside big business for decades, including iron ore export, LNG production, as well as an ammonia fertiliser plant. Retired CSIRO scientist Dr John Black says there's already evidence to show emissions from industry in the area are impacting the rock. So long as these emissions that form acid continue on the borough, this outer patina, which is absolutely essential for, for, for maintenance of the, of, of the petroglyphs, will, uh, will dissolve. Because it's slowly being degraded, uh, it's not seen to be so urgent. But some say the jury is still out. So it's a scenic and an aesthetic impact on uh, the cultural values and the cultural landscape values. I don't know if the science is showing that there's actually impact. I don't think it's been demonstrated at this point that, there, that, that the art is deteriorating and has deteriorated in the last 30 years. An EPA cumulative emission study is expected soon. While it's still years away from any results, a monitoring program has been set up under the Murujuga Rock Art Strategy. The Murujuga Corporation CEO says it hopes it will help in discussions to mitigate any risks in the future. I think we'll provide the scientific evidence uh, to prove, you know, beyond reasonable doubt that, that, you know, emissions are affecting our magnificent cultural heritage here on the borough. A new study has found that the estimated number of stolen generation survivors over 50 has almost doubled in the last two years. Now that's largely down to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were removed from their families becoming more willing to report their experiences. This research by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has also found vast health and welfare discrepancies between these groups and the wider population. Stolen generation survivors over 50 are three times more likely to be living with a severe disability and 2.7 times more likely to suffer from poor health. They're also almost five times more likely to have kidney disease, three times more likely to suffer from diabetes, and 2.7 times more likely to have heart, stroke or vascular disease. Fiona Comforce is the CEO of the Healing Foundation and she launched the Make Healing Happen report at today's National Press Club. We know with certainty now that unless we address the impact of trauma carried across generations, efforts to close gaps will be compromised. A key but unsurprising finding from these analyses is that stolen generation survivors and their descendants carry higher levels of disadvantage across life outcomes compared to the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were already carrying disadvantage in comparison to non-First Nations peoples. So there is a gap within the gap for each and every outcome. The gap within the gap. I mean, these are stunning discrepancies, Catherine, that, that we have here. Mm -hmm. Is this a question of the data ca catching up to what you've known for a long time about the ongoing impact of, of this trauma? I, look, I think it is uh, It is absolutely the data catching up and it's, it's not that the stories weren't there, it's the ability to layer those stories mm -hmm. um, and it, it is also in the numbers of people now able to comfortably identify as members of the stolen generation because, you know, there was a reason people didn't identify. Uh, assimilation was a terrible, terrible, cruel thing. It not only removed you from your culture but it also told you that your families and your culture were not okay. Um, and I think the way my nana was described it is, is the only way to describe it and she says when she talks about those times she says white people were really cruel and that's there's, there's no other description for that but it also shows um, and again it, it shows something really fundamentally important at this point in time and that is that a lot of that damage was done in early childhood which is why people are screaming to get all over the early childhood space and to get into the pre-prevention space and, the, and, and to enable families to thrive at that early point in, in time because a lot of that trauma, trauma comes at that point.
point in time. We know when they talk about things like intergenerational trauma, we know that those impacts, um, they alter our DNA forever. It cannot be fixed. This is, this is what has happened, that trauma is carried. And so that means that people like myself carry that um, that altered trauma. Um, you know, my grandfather was a member of the stolen generation and, and you know, he didn't talk about it much um, because he was a very positive man and, and, you know, I come from a very positive family. We, we, we tend to try and look at what we can do. Um, but he would occasionally bring it up and, and one of the things he once told us was that he cried himself to sleep every night every single night that he was away from his mother. And certainly the day he told us that he was dying and that he knew that he was dying, it's the first time he actually said, you know, that bastard had blue eyes. Um, and that was the first time I saw him cry in my whole lifetime was when he told me that bastard had blue eyes. Do you feel that you carry that, those stories with you, within you? Oh, absolutely. It's it's heartbreaking. It is. And it's heartbreaking when people say it didn't happen. Um, it's heartbreaking when people don't understand what the traumatic impact is and, and how that affects us and how it affects our health and, and our life outcomes. Uh, and certainly it's something that um, needs, needs addressing and, and needs some healing around. So how do uh, surveys and, and results like this impact the work that you do with young people? Oh, it's critical. It, it underpins all the work that we do. And, and um, early education and care is one of our priority pillars for SNAKE. And that is understanding that we need to be able to support our families better in this space. Uh, we need to be able to um, give families the support that they need. We need to give families the information that they need. And we need to make sure that access to the services and education um, uh, facilities are a place that we can actually go to, not only as a child, but as a family and engage and be part of, uh, because these sorts of intergenerational traumas, they just keep repeating. And, and certainly, you know, we are afraid of the education system. A lot of our mob are afraid of the education system because interventions happen at that point in time. And a lot of the way we think is framed under the banner of the stolen generation, you know, even, even at, at, I think there isn't probably an Aboriginal person around who hasn't at some stage as a child, you know, run away from a white car or um, wondered in their own child raising if someone was looking at you, um, ready to take your kid off you. Mm. And we're, we're, we're um, almost out of time, but I wanted to mention as well like the, the ongoing impacts today. Is it one in 18 Indigenous kids mm. who are still in, in home care? How should we be yes. thinking about that group which is actually getting bigger and bigger mm, it is it the projections currently say that that number the number of children and out of home, aboriginal and torres strait islander children in out of home care will double by 2029 without significant transformation in the out of home care system um, and again it all goes back to that early childhood investing at the right time investing in early intervention and that is transformative structural change that is starting to move your service delivery to indigenous led solutions you know working with the experts on the ground looking at how we work as a community because we we, we tend to work out our, our children don't belong to us as parents our children belong to our families and communities so there we have a different way of being able to manage um, our families when they come into points of distress um, and, and certainly it, it's something that um, needs to be looked at because like these figures say, every time a child is removed from their family and their community and their environment, it causes harm, it causes intergenerational harm. So their life outcomes are yeah. impacted on by that point in time, but so are their children's and their grandchildren's and so on and so on. And Which so is on. why this data is so important. I'm going to have to end on that sober note, but I really want to thank everyone who contributed tonight. Michelle Arrow, Catherine Little, Amy Ramikas, Kate Carnell. Have a great evening. You're going to have Ellen tomorrow. Good night.